The next body of evidence that reveals this overall pattern of evolution comes from comparative anatomy. Now, in comparative anatomy, we're actually looking at the physical form of each individual species. And fossil species often show combinations of traits that are not found in their descendants. And here's a recent example that is really quite remarkable. It was only discovered in 2008. It's called Puigilla darwini, and it lived about 20 million years ago in the lakes of northern Canada. And it is clearly an otter-like animal, okay? Long body. And it has a fascinating head. It turns out to be an ancestor to the pinnipeds. Those are the seals and sea lions. So here you have this body of an otter, but the head is that of a seal. It's got the head of a seal on the body of an otter. Now, the reason this is called Darwinii is that he said, a strictly terrestrial animal, by occasionally hunting for food in shallow water, then in streams or lakes, might at last be converted into an animal so thoroughly aquatic as to brave the open ocean. Now, in the last lecture, we saw that whales are descended from hippos, so that's an animal that's already in the water, but they're not related to carnivores. However, the sea lions and seals are related to carnivores, and their link is through the, wa through the water with otters, otters being a water-living carnivore. And so, as Darwin predicted, there has been found an ancestor to these that still has arms and legs, okay, like a modern otter, but it already had the head of a seal so it could grab things in the open ocean. And then ultimately, there was selection favoring the transformation of these hind legs into flippers. Now, we've seen this before, but it's worth revisiting because this is such an extraordinary fossil. This is Archaeopteryx. And here we see the fossil feathers, and we now know there's a lot of feathers in dinosaurs of that time period. And, but unlike modern birds, it has teeth. So you have this transitional form as we go from dinosaurs with teeth, but they have feathers, eventually we'll get to birds without teeth. Now, we can use this idea of these traits that persist for some time into the transitional form, ultimately into descendant species, with that concept of homology I introduced to you in the last lecture. So any trait that is passed on from an original species to a descendant species, relatively unmodified, is a homology. And so if we look in more detail at Archaeopteryx, it has a lot of the characteristics of a dinosaur. So here is a, a, an animal that doesn't yet have feathers or anything. It has a typical kind of pelvis, has fairly simple ribs and a certain shape to its shoulder. And what we see in Archaeopteryx is again the same kind of pelvis. It has certain things that are very similar. And then it has already, though, a wishbone. This is a special bone that it's going to need in order to keep its chest very active in the process of flapping its wings. Okay? So now we have the origin of a new trait, the wishbone, which is then passed on as a homologous trait to descendants in modern birds. Okay? So we have some traits being retained. These are homologous traits. They have them because of common ancestry. Here is a derived trait, the wishbone, which now becomes homologous in its descendant species because they share this because of common ancestry. And so we have certain traits that are going to be retained in modern birds from Archaeopteryx. And the Archaeopteryx has retained certain bones that it had from its reptilian, more clearly terrestrial reptilian lifestyle. Now sometimes these homologous traits lie dormant in the bodies of a descendant species. And as we know, no modern bird ever grows teeth. But birds descend from ancestors that did grow teeth. Okay? Now, let's look at a really remarkable experiment that was performed in the last few years. We're going to look at the early development of the teeth in an alligator 
and the beak of a chicken. Okay? Now these have little buds here on the upper jaw and the lower jaw of an alligator that will eventually grow into teeth. Chickens do not have these buds, so they don't grow teeth. Okay? Unless you play around with the chickens, and if you find the right regulatory gene and activate it, then the chicken beak that ordinarily never grows teeth still has the instructions in there should the gene be activated to start growing teeth. So there has now been a mutant chicken developed that has these little tooth buds and they'll grow teeth. So they retained through the ancestry back to the dinosaurs of the ability to grow teeth. They just generally don't express it unless you play around with them. Now we see these kinds of ancestral structures in a lot of modern organisms. So fish in their circulatory system have a heart that pumps blood out to different parts of the body and they have all these different what are called aortic arches, okay, to get the blood out to the body. Now the frog retains that same basic blueprint with these parallel arches but a lot of them have disappeared so there's a lesser number left. And this is now the same in mammals. So the underlying blueprint is quite similar, but some of them have been turned off, and so they have less of a parallel structure. But the underlying blueprint reveals its ancestry all the way back to the earliest vertebrates. We saw whales in the last lecture. We know now that they were related to hippos. And it's quite remarkable that we have here an organism like a whale that would have foraged on land much of the land, uh, much of the time, and then spent only a certain amount of times its water, to becoming a species that now lives almost always in the water, eventually losing its feet to becoming flippers, okay? But they had hind legs, okay? They could walk around, especially when they're up near the shore, okay? So we've had these big whales from about 50 million years ago, whale-sized animals, with hind legs, okay, and then eventually those are going to change into flippers, okay? So there are the hind legs. Now, as we go along and we look at some of these fossils, here is a wonderful one called Myocetus, and it's a fossil of a pregnant female. And remember, she is descended from a hippo, from a land animal, and She's pregnant, and what's fascinating about this particular example is that the fetus is pointing head backwards. So it would have emerged from the birth canal head first. That's like human babies. That's like cows, horse, and sheep. All terrestrial mammals have head first birth. And so these fossil whales, who are clearly whales, they're no longer hippos, but they still gave birth head first. Okay? But modern whales don't. Whales are the only modern mammal that give birth tail first, and that's an adaptation to being able to give birth in the water. Okay? Giving birth in the water, the baby needs to have its head in until the last minute. Okay? So that is a derived trait that has happened only recently. But these ancestral whales show even early ancestral traits of having birth head first. So in whale evolution, we have these original descendants from hippos, they have hind legs, they would occasionally come out on land, presumably that's why they still gave birth head first, because they would come up on the land to give birth. But then after a while, they're now completely in the water, and their hind legs have gone completely, and we have now the anatomy of the modern whale. But if you look inside the skeleton of a modern whale, even though they haven't had legs for 20 or 30 million years, they still have a vestigial pelvis. This is where their hind legs used to attach. It's still there. So we see traces of their ancestry when they were once terrestrial animals. So this is now a new term we want to use in looking at comparative anatomy. It's called a vestigial trait. It's a homologous structure. It's there because it was present in the ancestors but now it's either rudimentary or no longer used, so it's vestigial. Now, snakes are related to lizards, 
and snakes originally would have had legs, front legs and hind legs. And here's a wonderful fossil snake from about 95 million years ago. And if we blow up this certain segment right here, right here, it still had its hind legs. So these early snakes, we have that transitional form still showing their affinity to their ancestor, which had hind legs like lizards, but they're now vestigial, almost gone. So we even have in modern snakes traces of that ancestry. We look low down towards the end of the snake's body, back where they would have had those vestigial legs in the previous example. There are a few bones here, these spurs here. That's actually the ilium, which was part of the pelvis, the femur, the upper leg, and then the vestigial hind limb. So there are still traces that snakes once had legs. Now, we will see that there are certain genes that can have really quite extraordinary effects, okay? And so the scientists monkeyed around there with the chicken to get them to grow teeth. They had the capacity for growing teeth that was dormant until the scientists activated it. Sometimes these happen accidentally through natural mutations. So here's a mutant snake that has two heads. Here's a chicken that's got four legs, okay? And here is a mutant snake, okay, that this is from a lineage that hasn't had legs in tens, nearly 100 million years, and yet they too still retain the instructions when revealed by the right mutation to grow a leg with even toes, okay? So snakes retain, although it's been turned off, they retain the genetic instructions, instructions to grow toes. So this now, we're about to look at another aspect of comparative anatomy, and this focuses on the earliest stages of physical development. What happens in the course of development of an embryo? And a very famous 19th century German biologist named Huckel, I think I said that right, Huckel, wrote this three-word statement that people sometimes like to show off by saying, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Okay? What he's saying there is that physical development, early physical development, reveals evolutionary history. Phylogeny we saw in the phylogenetic trees. The phylogeny is an evolutionary tree. Ontogeny is the process of early development. So development reveals evolutionary history. And he produced these drawings uh, at the beginning of the 20th century where he would take the earliest phase of an embryo in a fish, salamander, tortoise, chicken, rabbit, and human, and then see how they developed through the course of uh, early development. And what is very clear is how similar these are in that earliest stage. Our earliest human embryos look like tadpoles. It looks like the tadpole of a salamander or of a fish, okay? And as development proceeds, then these get more and more distinct from each other so that by the time we have a fetus of a human, it is clearly a human fetus rather than a fish. Okay, But what we have in here for some time are these little traits, like leftovers of a tail, that persist for some time. Now, Heckel has been criticized because these are pretty exaggerated in the extent to which these seem to be similar at this phase. These are actual photographs. And so even in this middle phase, eh, that's a little too, that's not very accurate comparing humans to fishes and salamanders, but it is still the case in these early phases. You, stu you do see traits like the tail in all these different species, okay? Now, he exaggerated those similarities, but clearly he was right that there are homologies that are present in these embryotic forms, that we retain a tail because our ancestors ultimately way back when had a tail, but we only see that in the earliest stage of development. Now let's talk about the human embryonic tail. In those earliest phases, we have actually a little tiny tail, our embryos do, and they contain 12 vertebrae. And these are homologous forms because our ancestors would have had tails, okay? But they disappear by about eight weeks, most of the time. There are a small number of children who are born around the world every year with actual tails. 
So, oh, this is an extreme example. Uh, this is the biggest one I've ever seen of a boy who at 12 years old had a tail that was nine inches long. So just like the whale's pelvis and the leg bones of snakes, at least a few of us um, have tails. We all had tails in early embryonic phase. And just like those mutant snakes and the mutant chicken, the instructions can, can still work to produce a tail even in humans. So through this section, what I wanted to emphasize is that both embryology and anatomy reveal traits in descendant species that were found in early ancestors. And these provide very powerful evidence for the connectedness of each modern species to its ancestral form.